So good evening everybody and welcome. It's James Halliwell here from the Lex Van Dam Trading Academy, Head of Markets. We've got a lot to get through and as we did last time, we'll try and keep this to one hour, um, allowing for plenty of time to go through your questions as well. The topic of uh, today's webinar is going to focus on um, the first step in Lex's five-step trading method, um, which is known as idea generation. And this can be applied to any um, and in fact, all of the uh, asset classes or markets that we instruct uh, within the course and we look at here at the academy, whether it be currencies, stocks, uh, commodities, including precious metals, um, or anything else for that matter. But today, uh, David is going to be focusing on um, idea generation for stocks specifically. So you can find some really good themes as we'll go into around uh, energy. Um, so you can pick single stocks in your portfolio. Uh, and look to add a completely new theme to that, which will complement your positions. So just before we begin, we'll get the um, the mandatory, but nonetheless very important uh, disclaimer out of the way. So just as a reminder, um, we are, of course, an education provider. Uh, we're not a, an asset manager or advisory broker, IFA, uh, whatever it may be. So the examples and information that we provide uh, within the course of this presentation, as with everything else we do, uh, is not intended to um, constitute as investment advice or we're not uh, soliciting trade ideas, encouraging you or inducing you to trade. So you're responsible for your trading results um, and full information uh, in terms of this, this disclaimer can be found on our website, lexvandam.com. This is the second installment in the webinar series with the first presentation that Lex and I did two weeks ago, beginning with trading psychology. For those of you who, who couldn't make it or uh, are new to the academy, just by a way of a brief introduction to Lex Van Dam, essentially Lex is a hedge fund manager, having traded for over 23 years at the likes of Goldman Sachs, uh, a fund known as GLG Partners, which at the time was the largest hedge fund in Europe. And he's also the creator of the BBC television series Million Dollar Traders, which is how uh, we got the name for the, uh, for the courses and for the programs that we teach here. Alongside this, the Trading Academy, where we teach the public and also professionals uh, through our corporate programs, his methods so that you can effectively emulate his style and develop your own approach using his framework to improve your trading results. So a very brief one, and as ever, we, we don't like being overly commercial with these things, so we'll keep it very short. Um, the Academy, just as a quick overview, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, um, what we provide in the form of the Million Dollar Traders course, which is an online program covering each of the asset classes that I've mentioned, namely stocks, currencies, commodities, and then also specialist units in technical trading strategies for those of you that are more um, automated in your trading. And then there's also the Trading Club, which are effectively a, a research subscription. Um, we use some of the hedge fund intelligence that Lexus uh, has access to, the data that we have from Bloomberg subscriptions also, and really condense and distill that down and present it to you so that if you are trading actively, whether you've learned with us, uh, having taken the course or otherwise, that's available to everybody. And he covers each of the major asset classes with some very good stuff. But I don't want to go into uh, too much detail there because the focus today is on idea generation and the first part of Lex's method that we teach within the course. So you can see that highlighted here, the, the methodology that Lex uses to trade and has done so throughout his career, uh, he's called his five-step trading process. And it doesn't take a mathematical genius to, uh, to figure out um, why it's called five-step trading. Um, even I can figure out this one. It's essentially comprised of idea generation being the first step that we're going to look at today. Then moves on to looking at fundamental analysis, which we'll cover examples of in a moment, along with technical analysis, trading psychology, and also risk management. So the really important thing to emphasize here is that unlike many other educators, we place an equal weighting on each of these five steps. So it's not a case of teaching 80% technical analysis and having no regard or very little regard for fundamentals and then just doing a bit on risk management. It's a robust trading process. You'll hear this a lot. And as Lex said in the first webinar that we held together a couple of weeks ago, it doesn't appear to be rocket science. However, we guarantee that if you follow this process with this combination, it is the proven 
and most effective way of trading, Lex believes, and ultimately his success professionally and that of our students is testament to this. So that's what we believe in. So what do we mean by idea generation? Essentially, you've got two approaches uh, of this. It's how you come up with um, a view of the world and potentially I identify an investment theme. Uh, the two ways of doing this are either what they call a top-down based approach, where we generally look at macroeconomic conditions. And then the alternative is a bottom-up approach, where you think of yourself typically, as I say, as the consumer, and then build out your ideas from there or your view of the world from there. So, for example, are you shopping more frequently um, at Morrison's as a supermarket or Sainsbury's in the UK? Or are you um, shopping at the likes of Ocado, Waitrose and so on? Are you shopping more regularly, less regularly, blah, 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 blah. You can build it up from there. There will be much more on this later as idea generation, as we've said, is going to be the topic of today's uh, webinar. So I'll, uh, I'll keep this fairly brief. So on to the, uh, the second step, fundamental analysis. So once you've uh, identified a potential theme or potential idea, what we would then look to do is see whether we ultimately want to own that company. So it may be a good idea uh, in our heads, but on paper, the, um, the valuation of the company and the financial health of a company, if we're looking at stocks, could be quite different. And we may find out something about the company's management and so on uh, that we don't like. It's a little bit different in currencies and commodities. Um, if we were to talk about uh, commodities, you're looking at more supply and demand based factors or supply factors in the case of fundamentals and then the demand coming through uh, also from the consumers. Um, and for, uh, for currencies, of course, you've got to look at many other drivers and not just the macroeconomic factors such as interest rates, inflation and so on um, that ultimately drive the, uh, the value of a currency. But what it comes down to at this stage is ultimately deciding whether something is fairly valued or is over, over or undervalued and based on that, whether or not we want to own it ultimately. So one example of this, um, as we looked at in the last webinar, if you joined us, it's an ongoing theme. It certainly hasn't changed in the last two weeks. We're looking at the best part of the last five years. Um, we're looking at a slowdown in China. And what you can see in, uh, in yellow is Chinese CPI, which is Chinese inflation, and the relationship that that has to the Australian dollar. So when when the Chinese economy is slowing down, um, demand for commodities and other goods from Australia, which the Australian economy is heavily reliant on, drops as well. So as such, the currency also depreciates in value. And you can see the relationship here. So those are the fundamentals driving a currency. And of course, this presentation is going to focus mainly on stock idea generation. So we won't spend too much time here. This is uh, the form of fundamental analysis that most stock investors will be familiar with, um, where you're looking at uh, the financial reports, statements, and ultimately the accounts of a company. So you would be looking at, in basic terms, the assets of the company versus the liabilities of the company, and all sorts of things to determine the financial strength, and from which you're basing the valuation of the company uh, through multiples and so on uh, using it. So you can see an example here. Uh, from Yahoo Finance. Again, won't uh, go too deep down into the numbers, but we're looking at profitability on the income statement. Moving on to the third step, technical analysis is probably one of the first things, if you're new to trading, that many people um, put in front of you um, and encourage you to attempt to master. So it's something that gets a lot of coverage, but is often um, somewhat misunderstood, but quite routinely um, Mis misapplied and misused. So people tend to, when the beginning, be over reliant on technical analysis and just making decisions based on the charts and based on the price action and technical indicators, which ultimately lag uh, price. So what do we what do we mean when we look at technical analysis within our program? Um, essentially, we're trying to gauge market conditions by looking at price action and getting a perspective on it. We're also trying to understand the sentiment of investors and participants in the market, which can be quite tricky and difficult to quantify without this. Ultimately, we're looking to time our trades. So we may be hanging on to um, basically enter a trade if it's on our watch list. We've done all our research, but the time may not be right. It will help us determine a good entry point and ultimately decide before we get in, have a line in the sand to determine where we get in 
and where we get out. So we have targets and we can size our position or adjust our risk on the trade accordingly, which is part of the fifth step. So as you can see here, um, a few technical indicators on here. The lines being the exponential moving averages uh, on the top of the chart. Of course, they come in all different uh, shapes and sizes in terms of periodicities, and it's all very personal to the analyst. There's no right and no wrong, despite what people will often tell you, saying there's a golden combination of these. Of course, there's the golden cross of the 50 and 200 day moving average, but there really is no right and wrong. So don't just copy these on your chart um, because we're using them. It really doesn't mean uh, that much. Um, Below that, you can see, for example, a technical indicator, the MACD, so a momentum oscillator, and beneath that, the relative strength index, which indicates overbought and oversold conditions uh, as it looks at price momentum. So that's an example of what we mean by uh, technical analysis, or TA. So on to trading psychology. We covered this last time. Um, if you did miss it, um, you can find the video on YouTube. So it'll be a full one-hour uh, presentation that Lex and I did. Um, so if you did miss it, have a look there, and we can... Uh, we can have a run through uh, in your own time and pick up with any questions further to that. Um, this is the five factor model that in fact was used behind the scenes in Million Dollar Traders to uh, assess the mental toughness of each of the participants. So what do we mean by this? We're looking at motivational factors, so your reasons for trading, your self-confidence. So it's, it's all well and good being self-confident um, if you've got uh, you know the right research and you're following the correct process in your trading uh, self-confidence alone isn't necessarily a, an absolute uh, advantage um, focus so are you uh, are you fully aware of what's going on around you and ultimately are you sharp enough to pull the trigger when the time is right composure to do so so when a trade starts going against you you're going to panic is your face going to go red are you going to run out of the room I guarantee that you make mistakes when you uh, lack composure or when you lose your composure and then finally uh, resilience so uh, let's just move on to uh, market psychology here you can see mass positioning um, indicated by a number of futures that professional speculators are long of in currencies and in this case the Australian dollar you can see that when speculators are long of the currency so they expect prices to go higher when it reached extremes above 50,000 uh, contracts, the red line, you can see that prices tended to stall. So in other words, there were no, everybody was crowded into the trade and there were no further buyers remaining to come in and push prices higher. And similarly, uh, when everybody had got extremely short, there were very few sellers remaining, uh, circled in green. So price, exhaustion, price uh, reached a point of exhaustion. Uh, as you can see circled on here. Of course, these are nice examples. It never plays out as cleanly as this or rarely does uh, in trading, but these are the principles uh, that you begin to apply and you will do with some success over time and over um, a number of different currencies. So moving on to the fifth and final example, we've got risk management. Ultimately, it comes down to living to trade another day. So you never lose too much money today so that you stop trading and you can't take the next trade tomorrow when the market opens. It's about making more money when you're right than you lose when you're wrong. So the old adage of cutting losers quickly and running your winners is the most important thing you can learn in trading. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's get on to uh, idea generation. I'm going to introduce uh, Debbie Morrison, who um, you once had opportunity to hear from before at the Academy. So he is going to run through uh, idea generation for uh, stocks. So take it away, David. Great. Thank you very much indeed, James. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, so we're back on to idea generation. And uh, earlier on, James uh, went through uh, very well the, uh, the idea of a top-down approach and also a bottom-up approach. So um, top-down, looking at big themes, and then from bottom-up, maybe for uh, looking at something from your own experience, your own uh, area of expertise for instance I mean if you're in a you might work in accounts and you might have seen recently how there's a new system called zero which has come in and has been taken up quite rapidly uh, some people would say to uh, the, the old um, accounting software package called sage is disadvantaged and so there you know you could you'd be able to gauge from yourself whether your customers clients were taking this up whether it was a good product or not so there's an example and James obviously gave the uh, the other ones about supermarkets and sort of what changes on your high street but the one I want to look at as you can see from this slide is, is energy this is my big top-down theme something I've just 
been considering and thinking about and wondering how you can then how I can turn that into a tradable idea or at least take the first step into hopefully coming up with a, a, a tradable idea. So the outlook for energy. Well, there's one thing that's for sure, and I'll show you a few slides in a minute to, to demonstrate this, but we're, there is a growing demand uh, for energy. Uh, a, uh, we have a big uh, growth in uh, global population. And of course, the more people you have on the planet, the more requirements you have for clean water, food, heat and shelter, which of course require energy. Uh, aside from this, of course, the developing world is getting richer. Uh, a, a very obvious example of this is China, uh, cars replacing bicycles. About 10 years ago, there was a song, and I think the first line was, there are 9 million bicycles in Beijing. Well, 10 years on, it's probably more accurate to say there are 9 million cars, perhaps even more, in Beijing. Uh, there's a big change there. Now, I know it doesn't scan very well from the point of view of lyrics, but it, it, it is the truth. There, there, there's been this big move away from bicycles to cars, uh, uh, people getting richer and using it's very much a status symbol now in China now, so riding around on a bike in Beijing isn't considered to be particularly stylish. Uh, the other thing, of course, meats now replacing grains, where a huge number, a huge proportion of the population uh, were living on, on rice and beans and, and, and agricultural products. Now uh, there's a bigger uh, demand for meat products. And of course, you move up the food chain. Uh, a chicken take, uh, is obviously going to eat the grain, but, but you move on and yeah, you go from chicken to pork to lamb and to beef. And you've got the, this sort of movement up and this is the greatest demand for uh, a product product like beef, which uh, takes in a lot more energy. It requires a lot more energy to produce a pound of beef than a pound of chicken. And it's not just the food stuffs, the water, the, the grain, it's the antibiotics, it's the fertilizers, it's everything else that goes along with that. Of course, another thing, growth in mobile technology. Now, this you could see as a real plus. Uh, you now are opening up parts of the world um, because of the growth in mobile technology, people are able to transfer money in a way that they weren't, be, weren't being able to before, especially in places like Africa. Africa, we're getting to a bank, or not just Africa, but Asia, places where it's difficult to get to a bank to make transfers. Now that kind of thing is available over a phone, uh, a smartphone. So, you know, there have been great advances, um, very, a lot of good things happening. But all in all, everything that we're talking about here requires the input of energy. Here's one of the slides I was referring to earlier, and, and for me, uh, the, I think the most stunning aspect of this. I mean, you can you can put this chart back, and it, you can you can go back to sort of probably uh, you know 100, uh, 100 BC or something, and it's pretty much a flat line until we start to take off in uh, you know uh, the 18th century or so, as you can see it picking up there, and then in 1800 we're up to a billion. Uh, 1927, the population of the planet is estimated to be two billion people. Well, we're less than 100 years on now, and we're up to we're over seven, we're seven and a half billion. And as you can see, if you look to the top right hand of that, uh, a pro, you know, a projection is for 2048, uh, a, a population of, uh, in the planet of, of nine billion. Now, there does seem to be, a, uh, it seems to be that the projection is topping out somewhat uh, at that level. But nevertheless, it's, it's an incredible statistic. Um, it's an incredible achievement, actually, when you think, of it, this is down to sort of so many gains that we have made uh, as a human race in keeping people alive and in, in, in feeding them, and of course in, in health issues and sanitation and everything else. Um, it, it, it is, is mind blowing to me that uh, in, in my short span on this planet, uh, we have more than doubled the population. So that's in uh, 50 years, we've more than doubled the population from 1960 to where we are now. Now, along with that, we've got to think about poverty as well and uh, you know how, how are we progressing it's already it's all fine that we've got we've got a growing population and uh, um, that's good news but I mean we've also got to think about health and wealth well-being um, this chart here is from Max Rosa it looks at uh, global poverty and it, it, it does look like relatively good news uh, you can see the, uh, the the yellow line on the chart there is a share of world population living in poverty the the uh, Red line is the share of world population living in extreme poverty. Now, these, of course, are both relative measures. And we, you know, we look at poverty and a lot of the times the politicians are talking about things in relative measures, not absolute. So, you know, we have to take this with a pinch of salt. And just because the numbers are coming down, which is a pretty big positive, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that there are any less people moving, uh, living in poverty because, of course, the population has grown. But nevertheless, it's a positive. But the, the, the black line there, I think, is possibly uh, the most significant. It's the one that's falling at the sharpest rate, and that shows the number of the, the percentage of the world population who are living on less than $1.25 a day, uh, and that is falling, and that can only be a good thing. But what is this all telling us? Well, it's telling us this, I think, and this is a, a, a chart showing global energy consumption from 1965 to just two years back. And you can see that we are growing, uh, the chart is going uh, upwards uh, quite dramatically. Uh, and this is really showing how our energy needs, our energy consumption has increased uh, over the past uh, 50 years. Uh, what is also, I think, uh, interesting is to see how uh, we are so reliant still on oil, gas and coal. And uh, we'll, I'll show you a chart in a little bit. It, it, it does, it, that doesn't seem to be changing any time soon. Um, but nevertheless, so we, we have these two things running together, the growth in population, and of course, uh, the growth in energy consumption. So where is our energy going to come from in the future? So this is sort of the idea. You know, what, what, what do we think about what, within this big theme of sort of you know, energy, energy, this need for energy, where is it going to come from? Well, we're still in the situation where fossil fuels are the cheapest form of energy and the most easily accessible. Of course, we've got the flip side to this, uh, the pollution, which is uh, outright harm, uh, harmful uh, and is as, uh, as far as uh, growing number of people feel is, is causing irreversible damage to the planet. Now, I don't want to get into the ins and outs of, of, of climate change or anything like that. But I mean, there is an undeniable move. Um, two things. First of all, we need more energy. Secondly, where's it going to come from? But thirdly, how, what's going to be in the mix? And I think it's generally acknowledged that whatever happens, whatever your viewpoint, we need to be smarter with our energy and how we generate it in how we use it. In other words, we have to be more efficient. And of course, that is happening. And it's now, I think, broadly accepted that we're going to be using, we are using a mix of sources. Um, but the alternative and renewables is going to become a larger part of the mix. Um, just how large a part is uh, something that uh, we'll only know in time. And this, of course, is, is part of a very dig vigorous debate and discussion at the moment. This chart, uh, again, is similar to the other chart, but uh, what I think this shows here is that um, energy requirements are, th th there has been a slight tip up in demand since around 2006, 2010. Uh, as you can see, it's the, it's the old fossil fuels which are making up the bulk of this. And this is, this is a projection up until 2030. That's why I think it's of interest. Uh, fossil fuels still expected to take up a large part of this. But you can just very slightly start to see that there is an increase in, well, not so much biomass and waste, but certainly there's a slight increase in other renewables. So this is really sort of where we're getting to. So there's a growing trend here an increased use of alternatives and renewables. And this is as political as much as anything. It's whether we like, whether you, whether you object to that or not. You know, the truth is that there is a, a, a move towards this. And this is despite the so-called new technologies of fracking. And bear in mind, fracking isn't that much of a new technology in itself. It's just the methods of doing it have come a lot, long, long way. And of course, we have got these ongoing efficiencies. Now, of course, there are huge problems with the alternatives at the moment. Uh, they are high cost. Um, certainly, if you uh, you know if you consider um, looking at any of these methods, if you look at sort of solar or, or geothermal or tidal or wind uh, at the levelized cost of electricity on a levelized cost of electricity basis, and that in takes into account the capital costs, decommissioning, waste, uh, the the actual cost of the fuel itself, then things such as solar are uh, and um, wind are, are still very high when you compare them to fossil fuels. But nevertheless, these costs do seem to be coming down over time. And uh, we have to take account of the fact that, yes, subsidies for these are falling. Uh, just in the past month, the, uh, the, the UK government has uh, uh, said that it's cutting back on subsidies for uh, onshore wind and also for uh, solar energy as well. And that's probably going to be a, a trend that we look for in the future as well. Nuclear, of course, we have a very long lead up time to getting a reactor built and uh, on stream, and we still have the real problem of dealing with the waste. So it may sound as though, you know, the, these things when we talk about like all in costs and using the terminologies and all the rest, it may sound as though there's an awful lot to know about energy, and there undoubtedly is, like anything else. However, a lot of these themes, David mentioned subsidies, 
uh, announced by the government for, uh, for, was it wind, you said? Well, yeah, I mean, they're cutting subsidies for uh, wind power, uh, onshore wind, and also solar. for solar yeah. in this country. And solar as well. It, these are the sorts of things that um, if, if you are picking up a newspaper, even if it's one, once a week, if you're picking up a Sunday paper, no doubt there'll be columns in business, finance, probably on some of the front pages in some cases. These sorts of themes will be, you know, at your fingertips, regardless of whether you're actively following the, the markets at the moment and investing in stocks. Um, well, it, yeah, I, I heard it on the radio. I think, I think. <laughs> there we go, in the shower probably. Right? <laughs> so there we go. It's, it's, it's not like we're sat here or, or David sat here as like a, an energy analyst no. or anything like that. This is just using the process that we teach to – come up with these ideas and just try and identify themes exactly as David's explaining. Um, a couple of questions uh, just as we see them come through. Uh, one good one from Colin here was asking, um, are there any good sources for obtaining the demographic uh, data? So I was thinking maybe uh, the likes of the World Central Bank and yeah, um, um, some of the central viewers like IMF and so on have yeah. these sorts well, of demographics? I'll tell you one of the best websites to use, and that's the uh, CIA website. Uh, well, that, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that is brilliant. I mean, that, that, that tells you just about everything you need to know about every country. Uh, are completely open. I mean, it's, you know, you just, just, just Google it and uh, there you are. Uh, very, very good one. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I'd use that as a starting, uh, a starting place for anything. You make a very good point. This is uh, analysis that you can do yourselves. It's, it, is, it is very straightforward. It's just starting with an idea, with a theme, and just drilling down a bit. And, you know, it can be fun doing that work. I enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy it, sort of Googling stuff and looking around stuff and looking around a topic. And, you know, it takes you in lots of different directions. Uh, and, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting what you can uncover, and it's interesting checking those facts and making sure that they are themselves, you know, they are facts and not, not just uh, hearsay or anything else. That's exactly what the guys did in the show as well. None of them in, in Million Dollar Traders, uh, when Lex taught the, the same methods, none of those guys had, had any experience of, of trading mm. or finance uh, prior to that. Um, so it, they had the, the knowledge from their own business, if you like, or their own lifestyles. Yeah that ultimately equipped them to come up with, to view the world in different ways and generate some quite different ideas and varied ideas, which, you know, produce some very different results as well. Yeah. Um, but following the same sort of process. So we're, we're trying to explain the framework of the process by which we trade Absolutely. and the methods we teach. This, this is, yeah, indeed. Yeah. This is it. It's the, it's the process and it's sort of being able to return to that process time and time again. Uh, and it, it's that kind of thing which can bring a consistency into your trading. And it's the consistency that ultimately will help you be successful. I mean, that's really the key to it. So what, I, I just want to sort of follow through on, on this idea generation because it, it, it does lead somewhere, I promise you. Um, we're, yeah, renewables. Now, I think we, we probably do know that there are problems with uh, renewables in terms of the reliability of the supply. I mean, we all know the wind doesn't blow the whole time. The sun doesn't shine the whole time. The tides may ebb and flow. Uh, and even if you've got something like geothermal where you're drilling down into rock to, to, to extract heat, uh, that's pretty location specific. There aren't You can't do it everywhere. So what's the solution? Well, Part of the solution, a very, very big part, is solving the problem of energy storage. So this is, you've got all these renewable sources of energy, uh, but what do you do when the wind isn't blowing and uh, your wind turbine stops and therefore you, and the electricity stops? Um, and this is really what a lot of companies have been working on this at the moment. They're looking, they're working on really uh, the next generation of, of batteries and in fact that we've got a present generation of batteries which are being developed and built right at the moment and doing quite well now some of the companies involved in this there are battery producers such as panasonic johnson controls and lg chem Th these are these are names you can you can find very easily on, on uh, by googling car giants as well obviously they have a big interest in battery technology because there has been a big move towards hybrids and indeed uh, EVs and electronic vehicles as a whole. And it's not just cars here. We're talking about all kinds of vehicles. Uh, so GM, Toyota, Ford, Nissan, all doing this. And then, of course, there's the, the, the newcomers, and I, I'm Tesla and, and Solar City. And um, I just want to sort of go over this. I mean, a, a major character, a major uh, innovator at the moment, a chap called Elon Musk, who... Uh, 
runs Tesla Energy and, and Solar City. These are two of his companies. Tesla, as you might have heard from the Tesla electric car, very flash looking motor, very fast, uh, very exciting. Uh, having, having a few teething, teething problems, but also uh, Elon Musk's Solar City. Uh, this is where he's, he's, and this is his big idea. He wants to store solar energy, store solar power, have a way of storing it, and then we'll have solar energy on demand. So as he describes it, we've got a great big nuclear reactor up there in the sky. It's constantly going, and we can harness that energy and store it. And he's come a long way in doing that. Uh, just the other month, he did a presentation on YouTube, which if you just put in Elon Musk uh, and then Powerwall or Powerplaque, you'll be able to see. And he's talking here about a new generation of batteries, um, which are, uh, are, are look very nice indeed. I mean, they are the Apple, uh, you know, the, the iPad of the of the battery world. Uh, now, he's an interesting character. A lot of people say he was the, uh, the inspiration behind uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s character in Iron Man. Uh, I think there's also something on YouTube about that. I haven't watched that one, but never mind. Uh, he's um, open source. He believes in open source. So he, he puts his ideas out there. So people aren't fighting over patents. Uh, these are ideas that he starts off and, you know, he's happy for people to pick up his ideas and develop them and, and build on them. So, you know, he, he's someone worth watching. But I didn't I wouldn't want to sort of invest necessarily in Elon Musk. Uh, I don't really believe in investing in personalities. Um, you know, I think there are some great visionaries out there, and you know, Steve Jobs is a very obvious example. Bill Gates, another one. Um, but you know, that, that's a sort of there's a cult of personality which I, I, you know, I feel a bit uncomfortable about. Um, also, a little bit concerned about you know putting too much faith in one new technology, and uh, you know, I think. Uh, Elon Musk and his companies are doing great things, uh, but they're sort of at, at the, you know they're at the start of things. They're the, the guys who are going to go out and, and forge the way, but mistakes will be made along the way. And although he'll have a big following, and we'll have a look at his, the chart of the share price in a minute, um, it might not be the best way to to uh, go ahead. So what I'm thinking about, and from a lateral thinking point of view, is well, what all these people uh, are using, what all these guys with the with, with these trying to store this energy and uh, energy coming from whatever source, whether it's from solar or wherever, what they're using are batteries, uh, which are lithium ion batteries. And the thing that they need for lithium ion batteries is indeed lithium. So this lateral thinking is like thinking down the supply chain, right? Yeah, so, exactly. So what are the components that go into yeah. producing the component or the thing that goes into Absolutely. the bigger brother? What, what is it we, that, that they need? To, to build this thing, to make this thing. Uh, and, you know, if if demand, if they're going to be successful with their products and if their products are going to be take, uh, taken off and if comp and then, you know, they might get damaged by comp competitors coming into the market, uh, you know, developing their technology, making it cheaper, making it better, making it sexier, more interesting, like Apple did. And, you know, look how they destroyed BlackBerry and where are Nokia now and all the, you know, okay, they're still around, but you get, you get the picture. Uh, you know, so... I would say that those companies at the vanguard of these things uh, can be can be money makers, but they they also of course uh, run risk because if there aren't barriers to entry, if if they competition will just come in and try and uh, you know take their lunch. But if all of these guys need a single uh, a single commodity to uh, as the basis for what they are making producing uh then then let, let's go after that commodity instead that sort of makes sense to me so here's lithium uh, it's over there circled it's uh, the third element in the periodic table and it's very good uh for batteries uh amongst other things um and you can see the battery usage in, in electric vehicles uh, mobile phones. I mean, in fact, if you've ever uh, looked at the, had to change the battery in your uh, electronic key for your car, you'll see that's a lithium battery. I mean, they're all over the place. They're in laptops. They're in all kinds of electronic devices. And of course, now they're in the Tesla Powerwall, the Tesla Power Pack. This, as I say, this new generation of batteries where uh, Tesla hoped uh, that you know houses will be self-sufficient, not only in 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 taking in their own energy and, uh, for their own use, but even maybe uh, supplying that back onto the grid. So you know, it's, it's an attractive proposition. A bit expensive at the moment, but that's not to say it will be in the future. And lithium has other uses as well. Medical uh, is an obvious one, but also uh, a very large proportion of its ceramics and glass products. And, and we can see the breakdown here. 
And you can see sort of the bottom right hand corner, 29 percent of lithium is, is used in ceramics and glass. Uh, but just opposite that, 27 percent at the moment is uh, batteries. And that's really the, the bit that interests me. And the reason is because th as things stand and from what I've read, uh, projected demand is set to increase you know, quite dramatically. Conservative estimates put this as about 8 to 12 percent growth per annum in demand for lithium. Uh, and this is going to be you know, on the back of this tr of transport, the move away from petrol, diesel and even hybrid vehicles where, where um, transport, you know, where vehicles will be totally electric. And there are lots of downsides to those, those electric vehicles. I certainly wouldn't want one. It certainly wouldn't suit me. In, in the US, where uh, most uh, families have well, in multiple vehicles, not just one or two, but quite often three or four, it's quite likely that one of those will be uh, an electric vehicle. Uh, probably, if not already, then it will be It will be soon, because for short journeys and be, being able to charge it up overnight from a, a, a household plug socket, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very economical and everything else. So, you know, we could see more than 20% growth over the next few years of this. And then with, with the Tesla Powerwall coming through, and indeed there are new, mar new entrants into this market already. Already uh, Daimler Mercedes are looking at their own uh, energy storage component uh, for, for household domestic use. Um, you know, the, the lithium demand really could take off. So that's, that's really my thinking behind it. Now, OK, so how do we get involved in lithium? Well, there's a couple of ways. I mean, the first way is to look at who uh, who, who has the stuff in the first place and who produces it. Uh, here we can see a slide of the uh, the top um, product, uh, the top producers of lithium in the world. And we've got Australia, Chile and the People's Republic of China. So bear those three names in mind, because then we'll have a look at reserves. And so if we re-rank that for reserves, we've got Chile, China and Australia. So it's those three names that come out uh, each time in terms of who's producing the most and who's got the greatest reserves. And, you know, so Chile really is possibly the most uh, attractive of those those prospects, um, you know, as, as a lithium producer. So just let's just park that one and, and, and move on. So let's look at the companies involved in lithium production. Now, this is where you really have to do um, a bit of homework. Uh, and I, the reason I say that is because, yes, there are companies involved in lithium production, but in what way are they involved? Um, are they mining it? Is it the sole thing they are producing? Um, are they an intermediary? Um, and, you know, I mean, and I say that because, I mean, we can look at uh, that, that first name up there. Um, bear in mind that we were talking uh, about Chile. This, of course, is a company based in Chile, but it's uh, a stock that's tradable in the U.S., very large. Well, uh, 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 it is actually the largest lithium mining company. Now, there are other uh, other companies on this list, like uh, FMC, just below it, which has a, which has a, a, a different, uh, a much bigger, well, almost double the size market cap. Um, FMC is about six billion dollars. Um, uh, let's call it SQMC. Should we do that? Yeah, SQMC is <laughs> three and a half billion dollars. Uh, so you can see that FMC is a much bigger company, but it is diversified. It's not all lithium. Western Lithium, that's another one. Now, that's a real, well, relatively small cap, a Canadian company, uh, $75 million. So that's something else you have to be wary about. Uh, are you happy about putting money or, you know, investing or speculating on a stock with a low, uh, with a low market cap? It, I, I only say that because they can be volatile. Now, they can be very exciting uh, because they can be takeover targets. Uh, I'm, in fact, looking down the list at the next one, Albemarle. Now, Albemarle, again, 5.7 billion market cap. Cap, big lithium player just got bigger because of a takeover of a company called Rockwood earlier in the year. And then we have Lithium America's another Canadian outfit, 31 million market cap, so another small uh, producer. So, you know, uh, that it's when you get to this, this is, this is when we're going to, you know, the next stage, of course, in the process, um, as James has said, is the fundamental analysis, and that's really what uh, well, you know what we're talking about here. So you know we've, we, we're identifying a few companies. There are lots more out there. So this is just I mean this is no recommendation whatsoever. And in fact, when you look at the charts, which again is something that we do in detail in a later session, in a uh, later down the five-step process, uh, you would sort of probably 
uh, be thinking twice. But uh, nevertheless, that's something for the watch list. And at the bottom there, we have something called a Global X Lithium ETF. Now, if you're familiar with ETFs or exchange traded funds, uh, these are quite often excellent ways of getting exposure to a market uh, because they comprise a number of different stocks. But here's something else that you must be very cautious about when looking at ETS. And I think this global lithium one in, uh, really just uh, shows this up very well. Um, oh, OK. I'm, if, I tell you what, I'm going to come back to that, hold that one about the, the ETF. And let's just have a quick look at some charts here. And this is really what I was talking about earlier. This is this is um, Tesla. This is Egon, Elon Musk's um, Tesla company, uh, and you can see it's had a really a terrific uh, ride. This is a weekly chart. You can see from the last five, uh, sorry, the last uh, couple of years, uh, we've gone from uh, forty dollars to two hundred and eighty dollars, uh, and so it's been a tremendous uh, climb. Uh, we're sort of coming off the boil there, and you know, I mean, this is the, this is the thing. I mean, what do you do with a stock that's behaved so so you know has done so well? I mean, obviously, you can look at. Apple and, and and say well not to say it won't go higher but you know it, it looks pretty fully priced to me at the moment. Uh, Solar City this is another of Elon Musk's um, uh, stocks. Uh, this one yeah, seems to be stuck in a bit of a range. It's a you know again put some technical analysis on that, uh, put some Fibonacci on, and we, you know, there might be some trading opportunities. But again you know companies at the vanguard of something. Um, okay here we go. Here's the Sea Dad. Now th this really doesn't look like a very good chart at all. Um, and I think this is something that's going to sort of come out with uh, some of these uh, some of these um, uh, lithium stocks. Um, why? Again, this is something that is one for the fundament for fundamental analysis. But my understanding is that there's been some management issues uh, with this. Uh, there have been some country issues uh, with it being with the, uh, the mining company being based in Chile, which need investigation. And of course, we are in a bit of a commodity slump at the moment. What we're finding here is that, well, basically, there could be an amazing opportunity in in within this sector, not necessarily within this particular name. But what we're seeing is a lot of these companies beaten up, yeah, severely beaten up and in terrible shape. Yet fundamentally, there is a catalyst, mm, absolutely, which will eventually. To whatever extent it may be, that could vary, will eventually translate through into the fundamentals and the value of the company. Yeah. So, in fact, whilst perhaps if you're new to the markets, you may look at this, or maybe we're just a bit crazy uh, as professionals. If you look at this and go, my God, it looks like the worst investment idea I've ever seen, um, it's not necessarily the case. A professional's approach is to look to invest in unloved stocks so yeah. whether where it's mispriced and this is a potentially a prime example of this potentially time will tell only time will you tell. know they're absolutely right james uh you know if you can look back to sort of the lows back through 2008 2009 and you can see we're we know we're pretty near those at the moment and that you know that could be that you know that could be an interesting trade but i would say when um you know you Going on to fundamental analysis, it, it's important to sort of have a look at that balance sheet, see what their debt's like, for instance. I mean, that might be, you know, something that, that is, is, is hurting this company. We, 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 sure. don't, we wouldn't yeah. know until we do that, that kind of fundamental analysis on it. But, yeah, as James says, I mean, I, 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 it's on my watch list and then uh, it's one for further investigation. Uh, FMC, OK, well, you know, as I said before, uh, a bit more diversified. It's not just a lithium play. And I think you can see here, it, it, you know, it, it's come off as have uh, you know, commodity uh, commodity stocks. Uh, and uh, um, at the moment, uh, just sort of, you know, without putting any uh, without putting any sort of drawing tools on it or anything like that. But I mean, it's broken That's the low nice. from, uh, yeah, from late 2014. Uh, so it get you know not looking particularly clever, uh, but you know one for further investigation. I think this is uh, just while we're on this before we get on to yeah. the ETF chart. Just quickly, um, Carlos asked the question, and it may be one that other people um, have considered themselves. I think we've touched upon it. Over what time frames does this approach? So mm. the idea generation process. Over what sort of time frames are we looking to play this out over? I see that we're looking at weekly charts yeah. mainly here. OK, um, well, I'm, I put up the weekly charts because I just sort of wanted to get a lot of information on here. And uh, this you know, I'm, I'm not doing technical analysis here. So I just wanted to you know, just give you a, a big overview. And also my starting point 
before I always go from a, a, a longer perspective and then like to drill in. Uh, so I would start with a weekly chart, um, no matter what I was doing, to sort of get to get a perspective of where have we come from? Because it's you know when we have a, when we can see where we've come from, is there a broader trend? Uh, that we can play into and then uh, uh, and use. Uh, I mean, I could almost. You see, I could draw a line between uh-huh. the late 2008 uh, to 2012. I'm picking out lows here to 2000 and early late 2014, and it looks to me like there's sort of there's an upper trend line which has now been broken on this chart. So you know that. Do you see what I mean there? Well, I'll, I mean, be, the, I'll be the pessimist in the room, you? and I'll I'll be calling. No, I'm with you on that. I'll be calling yeah. for the. Uh, the 2008 highs around uh, just looking across our 36, 38. Yeah, it's, it doesn't. <laughs> That's look, what I think the next stop is. But then yeah, again, I know I agree. I mean, pessimist. I think it's I think it's broken that line, and I think you know I think that the, the next move on this is 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 lower uh, to me. And I, I yeah. I, I, and, and again, just just to remind people, though, the point is that this is a very very FMC corp, and this example is a very very diversified yeah, business, so it's, it's exposed to. All sorts of things which are hurting due to the commodities slowdown, which is the key theme and has been for a number of years, but at the moment is the theme that all of the world is paying attention to, and nobody in the world that I've met certainly wants to be long of uh, at the moment. Everybody's putting so much selling pressure uh, on commodities and continue to do so, it could fall further. Um, so that's ultimately what's really, really putting these companies under pressure. Um, but ultimately, hmm. Lithium, sir. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah, in the know, future it's going to translate through. Absolutely, it's it's you know it's a it's a commodity. It's an it's a it's a hard asset, isn't it? Uh, I mean, and a lot of what we're seeing at the moment is down to the the, do, uh, the stronger dollar. And yeah. although that the dollar has uh, perked up, well, sorry, has has pulled back a little bit. Uh, you know, we had a rally from uh, this time last year uh, to what March, I think it was, when we nearly broke, uh, we nearly got to parity euro against the dollar. Um, you know, and um, we'll just have to see how that this stronger dollar um, trade sort of plays out. Uh, but that is hurting commodities. Uh, everything that's priced in dollars. I don't really think that. I mean, Albemarle is another. Uh, it, it's a big diversified company. It's a chemical. Lots of you know, it's got interest in lots of chemicals. As I say, it did take over uh, another lithium company. Uh, lithium major called Rockwood earlier this year. So, I mean, that, you know, that's accounted for uh, some of its sell-off. Uh, but, you know, again, one, one, to, one to look at further. Um, now, yeah, I did mention earlier the, the ETF. And I think it's very, you know, the ETFs are very, very attractive because, I mean, they're bundling together. You know, if you want exposure to a particular market, then an ETF on the face of it uh, bungs together um, companies which are in that space um now you know if someone said well look, look, i want you know I, I want to get exposure to gold miners right okay but uh but i don't i don't like the majors i like the miners uh, no, i like the minor miners the small the small <laughs> gold miners uh you know there's an etf for that there's an there's an etf for the majors as well there's an etf for so many different things but um i would would really really um uh, you know, sort of emphasize the point to look inside that ETF, and and I think this is sort of one of the, one a good example of why you should. If we run down this one, so this is a, uh, a Global X Lithium ETF. So lithium, and you think, right, okay, I'm going to get exposure to lithium. Yes, you will, but there's going to be an awful lot of other things you get exposure to as well, whether you like it or not. Um, you see here, on, if you look at the uh, left hand side, you can see percent net assets. Now that is how much of the ETF is holding of any one of these named companies. So you can see, we talked about FMC a little bit earlier. Um, it's not a pure lithium play. And 16% of that, uh, of, F, uh, of the, the ETF is FMC. Uh, Albemarle, again, not a pure lithium play, but 12% is in the ETF. So now we're up to 28%. So that's, that's you know, that's over a quarter of, of two companies which are diversified. SAF Group, uh, FDG Electric Vehicles. Now that's a, a user. Of, of lithium, Panasonic, a, a user of lithium. Uh, well, we're, we know about Sociedad Guimikia. Um, yeah, that is a big lithium miner, but it's only 6% of the ETF. Tesla Motors, a user. Johnson Controls, a user. LG Chemical, a user. Samsung, a user. So, you know, within that, yes, you, these, it's not just producers of lithium who are, are making up that. It is producer, you know, you, you've got diversified 
producers, uh, and you've also got people, you know, companies that use lithium. So I would just say, you know, please beware. Caveat emptor. And there's the uh, there's a chart of the uh, lithium ETF, um, and again, that doesn't look too happy. Um, and if you think about how well uh, Tesla is doing at the moment, um, you know, as a com as a part of that. But you know, you think about the other components, and uh, perhaps you can sort of see, um, you know, why why it's not faring so well. Okay, so um, just to wrap up, as I say, idea generation really is just the first step. It's just, you know, I, I hope I've been able to sort of uh, communicate that it's of, of you, trying getting a sort of a, a theme and then sort of. Um, Drilling down in that theme and seeing where it takes you. And I, I, no, as James has said, and I, I really do assure you, you do not need to be any kind of expert to do this. Uh, you just need to, you know, think and think a bit laterally and see where things come out. And some kind, sometimes they'll come out at dead ends. Other times they won't. They'll take you to interesting things. As I say, I mean, I wouldn't say what, what we've we, we've done covered here is a dead end. I think there's some possible, you know, some interesting things, not necessarily for now, but maybe for the future. Uh, after that, of course, I've mentioned this fundamentals are next. Uh, technical analysis, all important. That's just where you get your entry and exit levels. And of course, it's psychology, knowing your own personal psychology. And I think this is very important to, for knowing whether you're, you know, you want to be you're suited, for, suited for day trading, for longer term trading. What's your attitude to risk? What can you take? Do you take it personal, personally, or can you can you overcome that? But also, you need to know about the market psychology as well. And finally, and most importantly, perhaps, is money and risk management. That is very comprehensive, but sounds like an awful lot. <laughs> but believe me, in reality, it's not if you have a process to follow. Yeah. And I think a good example that David just highlighted there using the ETF holdings is that if an ETF provider who makes money by issuing the ETF to invest in and does their research supposedly to scope out all of these niche lithium players? If they can only find a handful, they can't even fill an ETF of 10 yeah, names with pure yeah. lithium plays. If your idea is around the lithium theme, you've maybe only got three or four companies to keep an eye on. Familiarize yeah. yourself with and keep an eye on for years, potentially years. It might only be a few months if, uh, if things really pick up. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not a matter of becoming a stock analyst no. and having coverage of 50 companies for every idea that you generate, mm. lithium, oil, whatever the next one may be. Um, this is like a handful of companies. Even the pros can't find that many. Yeah, there's, <laughs> And I, the guys that are incentivized with money to find right. them. So it's like get to know three or four companies mm. really there, easy. There aren't that many pure lithium plays, and a lot of them are very, very small. So, you know, be wary. Uh, so yeah, as James said, you know, if if you are, you know, if you it is something that you think is a is a goer, you know, you do a little bit of a uh, little bit of uh, homework uh, and find out those companies where you know that you think are well run, that are low on debt and everything else, and have you know, you know have potential. And the the more niche the idea, yeah, and the more you see prices actually not going in the direction that you would expect. Mm. Perhaps the more original the idea, perhaps and that's what it all comes yeah, down to. Uh, perhaps the greater the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. It's an yeah. original idea. Absolutely. Everybody hasn't already invested in it. Mm. That's what it's about. Yep. <laughs> and hopefully everyone catches up with the idea and uh, you get an opportunity to sell <laughs> you need, the profit. Yeah, you do need those more buyers. <laughs> if you buy and nobody else buys, then uh, yeah, the price goes nowhere, and that's uh, yeah, it's impossible to make money. Absolutely. But uh, James, will, James will just wrap up now the last, the last few slides. I just wanted to – this is a just – this is my, my thoughts on it. If, if the analysis ultimately doesn't stack up, just ditch the trade idea. Go, you know, walk away. There's plenty. Of, they're, they're, you know, trade ideas come around the whole time, believe it or not. They really do. Uh, and, you know, things are in and out of favor. So don't don't chase it. Park the stocks in your watch list. You know, leave them for another time. See what happens. And remember, I mean, this, being early into a trade can be as harmful to your health, financial and mental, as being wrong. Uh, so, you know, please, please, please bear that in mind as well. But thank you very much. I'll pass you back to James now. That's all right. Yeah, so at this stage, guys, we'll just uh, welcome the opportunity for any further questions. We've got uh, 10 minutes or so, which we can run uh, through a few. I can see there are a number um, that, are, uh, that are waiting here. And thank you for so many of you uh, remaining on for the full duration uh, at the end of the day. We have um, a few questions here. I'll, I'll begin with one here from, uh, from Ayaz, who asks, uh, in regards to the ISM, um, which for those of you who haven't come across it before is one of the 
um, leading indicators, one of the economic indicators that we look at and instruct um, in the course. In relation to the ISM, do we find it useful for generating ideas uh, as part of this process? Uh, of course, as part of the top-down um, process for, of generating ideas, so looking at the broader economy and then working down to look at sectors within a particular country um, and then stocks within those sectors, it's definitely uh, a well-known approach and it's one that we teach in the course. I wouldn't say that's unique uh, to us. Many other people teach it. Uh, but that said, we, we do look at a lot more than simply um, the major leading economic indicators of which the ISM is one. Um, so whilst it's very important, it's not the only thing to look at. And as a more experienced investor, you will learn, uh, as Lex teaches, that no single indicator is entirely reliable and certainly not on, a, on an ongoing consistent basis over time. So the ISM uh, was being questioned only a couple of months ago, um, despite it being the best correlated leading economic indicator of the economic cycle uh, and therefore stock prices, arguably. So that, that to answer the question is yes, we do use it, uh, uh, we do teach it. Do we find it useful? Absolutely. Um, but it's just one thing of many, many different things that we look at. And as you can see here, it's quite possible to generate ideas using the process and methods that we teach and emphasize at the academy without relying on the three kind of major leading economic indicators uh, for the US, of which the ISM is one. So it's important, but in a QE or a, a, a money printing driven or led world uh, where the business cycle is being distorted um, in the eyes of the professionals, um, and conditions are very, very different. Stock prices don't behave exactly in line with what we see in business conditions. Indicators of the business cycle, such as the ISM, uh, just aren't as important as they were in the past. There are other things that are overriding them, and you need to take into account. So in isolation, no single indicator is ever going to um, be entirely uh, predictable. Uh, but that's part of the beauty. It would be really boring uh, if uh, you just got given signals and you had to follow them. Maybe some of you would like that, but that for me would be really boring and everybody would make money. Um, but then once everybody could make money off the same opportunity, there would be no money to make. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's just never going to happen. Let's put it that way. So we, we teach a number of things. So hopefully that answered the question, Ayaz. In terms of one or two other things here, um, you're very welcome, Ayaz, as well. Um, in terms of one or two other things here, um, a lot of people asking about the fundamental analysis component uh, and what exactly um, we look at there. Um, we will be doing, uh, I'll actually be doing the next webinar myself. Um, we'll be looking at idea, uh, sorry, a fundamental analysis of the currency market. We'll be looking at a slowdown in Asia uh, and in the emerging markets, uh, a resurgence in the dollar, so strengthening US dollar uh, and the effects that that's having. Uh, on commodities markets, but more importantly, how that's translating into the real economy, which is just a fancy term for GDP, which again is an economist term for the country. And if the country is doing badly, the currency should do badly. The currency should follow. It's as simple as that. So we'll be looking at some ideas around uh, the Singapore dollar, uh, amongst others, um, and highlighting the ongoing themes and weaknesses in the likes of the Australian dollar, some of the um, uh, some of the Asian currencies and other emerging market currencies worldwide, uh, including South African Rand uh, and also the Brazilian Real, which is one that I've been following very closely myself. Just to take another couple here, um, just before I move on. So in terms of the course, I can see a couple of you asking for um, exactly what the course is and what we teach. Um, this is just a slide summarizing it. I'd forgotten to actually move down onto this, so <laughs> thank you for prompting me. We mentioned the Million Dollar Traders course, the online course earlier. Uh, what this is, is a multi-asset program. So in other words, it teaches stocks, currencies, and commodities, uh, as David and I have, have mentioned earlier in this presentation. Uh, it, it includes over 50 high-definition video modules in there, which we're constantly adding to. Uh, in this case, uh, I believe we've gone up to 51 uh, as of last week. Uh, we include some current market case studies in there. David's recorded a couple of excellent ones on uh, the crude oil theme and how that's affecting uh, stocks in a similar way to uh, what we've looked at with 
uh, lithium plays and how it translates into companies' earnings and prospects and prices and so on. And in addition to that, there are a series of tools, essentially, um, spreadsheet models to help you uh, determine anything from the valuation of a, a company or a currency uh, to the relationship between, say, gold and interest rates and the drivers, ultimately, um, of underlying of the underlying asset which you can trade or investing. So that's essentially what it is. You can also take an exam in each of the modules. We are uh, certified at the academy. So if any of you are studying towards professional programs, as we often get asked, um, if any of you are financial advisors, for example, um, our courses are eligible towards the continuing education credits. So by taking the course and passing the exam, um, it does count towards that. Of course, for those of you who aren't studying professional programs, it's a great place to start. Should you ever uh, go down that direction, it's a great hallmark to having your CV. Um, and you know, even if you you don't ever use it for um, kind of career purposes, ultimately what you're getting from there is the professional's approach, Lex's approach, and his methods when it comes to trading, which have been proven and demonstrated through the Million Dollar Traders TV series and over the 20 plus years that he's been trading as a professional, the likes of Goldman Sachs, and most recently, and on an ongoing basis, the hedge fund. So it's all in there in the course. The Trading Club, uh, just to run through the next slide, uh, is, as I mentioned before, essentially a series of reports on a weekly and a monthly basis. We also have a Trading Club meeting. So similar to this, uh, of course, this being a webinar, it's the same format, um, but uh, Lex and I get together, uh, we go through the club reports and some of the ideas and themes that we're looking at currently. Um, David's done a, a similar presentation today with Lithium, but what we do is build in more of the um, information that's contained within the reports that all of our members access alongside the meetings on a weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis, um, and essentially distill that information and present it to you so you can get an idea of what we are really following at the Academy and Lex is following at the fund and ultimately get a gauge of what professional investors are looking at and how they're viewing uh, the world. So you can ultimately, um, you know, be better informed in your own trading. If you have questions further to the webinar about anything that we've run through and for, unfortunately, for the sake of time, for the many questions that we didn't get chance to, uh, to answer, um, they were all good. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad question. Um, so please, uh, please do uh, just send us a reminder on email or give us a call through uh, and we'll gladly, uh, gladly assist there. So thank you all very much for, um, for your attendance. Thank you for the very, very kind comments. Do keep in touch. There'll be another one coming in the series. And uh, yeah, it's great to have so many people here as this is new for us. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.